and I'll right. start letting people in. And Mary, if you want to maybe give it another couple of minutes before we start. Sure. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this, the first of the um, open forum events for 2022, um, which is being organized by EDIMS. And uh, EDIMS, uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Music Studies in Higher Education, um, was, was set up in 2020 in order to promote, support and share practice, good practice in relation to equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and um, it's my great uh, pleasure, Mary Stakelam is my name, I'm delighted to, to welcome you on behalf of the, um, the network and uh, to chair this session. Um, so um, th the point about the, the um, open forum events is just to, to get a chance to, to, to meet, to discuss, to share ideas um, and, and to make sure that everybody knows uh, what's going on because there is, since the um, initiation of this network, lots is, lots is going on. So this is, this is a way of just to sort of keep, keep us in connection and, and contact with each other. Um, so, so today um, we have uh, two hours for this event. And um, we've sort of organized it in two. So the first part, we have uh, two presenters, um, each um, giving um, a presentation about 15 minutes or so each with some time afterwards for questions. And the second half is um, an update or um, uh, reflect, a reflection, yeah, update on the associations and institutions um, that are um, attached to EDIMS in various ways. So, so um, very, very grateful to everybody who has volunteered to present today. And um, we certainly wanted to make time for discussion and to include you, our participants, um, in, in giving you a chance to, to um, join in, in in our discussions. So I'll, I'll, I'll start without further ado um, by welcoming um, our first speaker, uh, Faye Heald. And uh, Faye is Senior Lecturer in Ethnomusicology and Music Management at the University of Sheffield. And uh, she currently holds a Future Leaders Fellowship from UKRI, looking into increasing and diversifying participation in English folk singing. So thank you very much, Faye, and over to you. And meet, that's the key, isn't it? Right, hello. Uh, hopefully, is the screen coming up okay there? Lovely. Okay, yes, so thanks so much, Mary. Um, and it's great to be here talking with you. So I'm at the University of Sheffield. 
and I could talk lots about the things that generally we're doing in the department there. But for this presentation, I'm going to talk specifically about a project that I'm just starting now. Um, and EDI principles are really embedded into the whole of the research project. So I'm finding it quite an exciting time to be looking at these questions. And well, it's all I'm thinking about at the moment, to be honest. So it's a great time to come and talk with people because I want to get your ideas on, um, on what I'm thinking and ideas for developing that or doing that better or in different ways. Uh, so yes, this is a sharing of my plans rather than reporting back on anything in particular. The grant is, um, it sort of started, I'm, I'm an English folk singer, that's basically my passion, um, and the scene has been in huge demise for ages, so there's been sort of calls for save the folk clubs, um, and that's been a lot of my research has been sort of trying to find what the barriers are for people engaging with folk singing, and um, try and make the scene healthier. But for this grant, it's a big grant, it's a five year project with multiple research assistants and project managers and lots of resources and stuff. So it's a huge grant and it had to be a little bit more than just let's save the folk clubs. Um, so I've sort of delved into it a little bit more. Um, well, it feels a bit David and Goliath actually, but here's my kind of thing in a post-Brexit anti-colonialist heavy narrative. How do people want to positively engage with English cultural tradition through song? And how can we facilitate this and support participation? So basically, I'm saying celebrating your English heritage is quite problematic in ways that perhaps for other cultures is differently problematic. So what is it that's going on in England um, and how can we try and have some positive experiences with this? So rather than just looking at the established folk singing community and just trying to increase numbers a bit, it's, it's unpicking a bit more that deeper relationship with what the cultural tradition actually is. So that's a huge kind of undertaking um, for one individual. And so the way I proposed to do it was to do it through a huge um, a co-production methodology by basically bringing all the people I can on board from uh, the existing folk singers, the existing organisers, the, the, the big paid organisations down to the voluntary workers, and of course out beyond that as well into people that aren't currently participants in folk music, um, other funders who might be supportive of this. So huge, lots and lots of different kinds of communities can be involved or will be affected by this research. And so co-production brings them in to be involved in the actual process of research. So it's a kind of it's a two pronged research project. One prong is to try and understand this question. And the other prong is to really play with this kind of methodology of being really embedded as co-production. Um, I'm an ethnomusicologist by training, I suppose. And of course, this isn't new for ethnomusicology. People have worked with communities for a very long time. So a lot of the ethics around this have been rehearsed and discussed a lot. But the specific words of co-production and action research is another methodology I'm using are less used with ethnomusicology so it's really trying to bring that to the fore and see see what has already been going on in ethnomusicology and how we tie it up with the current debates in co-produced research and things which are very sort of fashionable beyond ethnomusicology. Okay so how I'm going to do this is this is a sort of structure of um, of the project. So I'm in this sort of bluey grey box, the academic box, um, and we're going to have a, an advisory board, a body there, so they actually have the power of the resource. Well, UKRI probably ultimately hold the power of where the money goes, but they, within our group, within my level, I make decisions based on what they tell me to do. And they decide what to do based on those yellow boxes. So they're going to be working groups um, around all the protected characteristics areas to make sure that we address all those different areas in relation, of course, to increasing and diversifying participation in folk singing. So they're going to come up with things that are problems, uh, issues, and then the advisory group will work out how it all works and what I should be doing. And then me and the team of academics will put resource into making those things happen. And then we'll test them out with the hubs um, then we'll go into a period of action research and we will try out different things that we think is going to happen um, and reflect on if that works or not and do a, a cyclical process of, of change and monitoring change. So that makes it again a bit different to typical ethnomusicology projects where you would go in and document an activity um, and then perhaps look at how those findings could be applied to make change. This is putting change in the, at the beginning of the research process. So that's kind of how 
people will get involved. I might go into more detail or ask me what's not clear because I'm rushing through a little bit. <clears throat> so co-production basically means uh, a distribution of power. It's co-produced rather than having an academic making all the decisions. Um, you make those decisions with people that the research is going to affect. So um, the, the bits I've been trying to get my head around recently is a co-produced project can also have lots of different levels and I will be engaging stakeholders or people that have a stake in the in the project in ways that aren't necessarily co-production. So co-production is a really fashionable term at the moment, but it means a very specific thing. And a lot of people do things like consultation or slightly fancy data collection, and it's not co-production. But And my project is going to include co-production and consultation and data collection. So I'm not saying that absolutely everything that happens is going to be equal power but the, the power structures are going to be built on a co-production level. Um, yes, so I'm really interested in, in the co-production methodology and the complexities of that as well at the minute. So people that have got on board at the moment are groups like queer folk who are looking at um, uh, sexuality and gender representation within, within the body of traditional songs and the repertoires, but then also in how people are performing it and the way that queer identity is um acknowledged or handled at all in the contemporary folk scene they're really interesting and then drake music are a disabled musicians charity not specifically folk music but look at ways of um creating employment opportunities for disabled musicians which is really useful and uh then individuals such as angeli morrison who is a black british traditional singer as well and trying to get her perspectives about what it's like to come from that different background and how she's handling it. She's doing an amazing project at the moment about um, writing hidden black narratives and trying to diversify the actual repertoire, not just the, the kinds of people performing the repertoire. So since the grant got announced, um, I've had loads and loads of people get in touch. So hundreds of people literally wanting to get involved. It's had a very, really warm reception. Um, and I'm finding some patterns in this though, because it's, it, it's often the organisations, the people who it's going to reflect well on them to be invo involved in a project like this are coming forward very readily. Um, that's not criticism, it's brilliant to have them on board, but I, it is rather overwhelmingly um, organisations that are used to working with funding, are used to organisational things, may have paid staff that have time to come and do things. Um, and there are a lot of people like me who are wanting to help and, and see the issues, but don't necessarily have lived experience, certainly in all the protected characteristics areas of, of areas of risk there. So, um, so it's about not just taking the easy collaborators, but trying to find the most appropriate collaborators as well. But it's been really, really interesting, the level of interest. Um, individuals have been coming forwards as well, and it's gonna be great making those working groups big and trying to include everybody that wants to have a say, at least consulting and collaborating with them, even if they can't all be involved in the, the final decision-making processes. I'm trying to find ways to make sure their voices are still included. Um, so the processes uh, to do that, because that's easy, you know, it's a nice idea to just say, yes, everybody join in. And then how am I actually going to manage that? Um, or my project manager who's going to sit in the office as well, how's this going to work? So I've, the, those yellow blobs earlier, the working groups, I want that to be completely open call. Anybody can join them who has an opinion on what the topic is. It doesn't have to be um, a lefty nice opinion, the kind of opinion that you want, um, because there are, there's a lot of really hot topics here, uh, especially in the race side. There's a lot of complexity around what is indigenous folk music within a British context. That means very, very different things to what indigenous music might mean in America or in Australia, for example. So we've got a very particular kind of set of questions and discussions here and all the perspectives need to come in. Um, so yes, so I'm trying to make it as open as possible to feed into the research. And what I want those groups to identify, because as well as an awful lot of people that are very, very passionate and believe they know everything as well um, and a lot of that is based on assumption and that's how how it works and it can be quite difficult 
to tell somebody that the thing that they assume isn't necessarily right and maybe it is right and this that's a bit of a difficult thing with lived experience versus academic research because it's absolutely right for them but it might not be more widely applicable so what I'm trying to do first of all to kind of iron that lot out is to get them to identify what we know what we think we know and what we don't know because there are things that you know folk club organizers have been trying to get people in for years and years and not being successful so they, there's clearly stuff that they don't know um, so to try and separate those out, so that what we know are some of the, the more nationally recognised things, they might be peer reviewed academic work, or they might be industry based things, things that apply more broadly than one or two events, um, and then there's the assumptions that people have, um, which might, might well be right, but there might be assumptions that need to be tested, and we can do research around those to either prove them, or show how how they might be more complex than the assumptions are and the stuff that people genuinely don't know and that they want answers to as well can be there so those boards will the, the little working groups will come up with those together with some academic support to kind of chair them as well and the advisory board will prioritize the grant resources based on what they want us to research what we need to find there so yeah it's going to be quite exciting what I'm going to do for the next five years. Normally, I be making the plans and I know what I'm doing, but I don't actually at the moment. It's quite weird. Um, part of the stuff I'm doing at the moment is preparing to get it wrong. So all I can do is put lots of plans in and structures in and cross my fingers and things. Um, and it was quite a nice penny drop moment for me because, uh, you know, lots of us, we quite like being right. We like getting things right. And it can be quite horrible if you're confronted or it can be quite scary to put yourself in a vulnerable situation to get things wrong. Um, and with this, I just had to absolutely decide that I will get things wrong. I know I'm going to get things wrong. I'm going to use the wrong language. I'm going to set the wrong structures up. I'm just going to, I will do things wrong. And just being well-meaning isn't probably enough. And I have to not just sit back on my laurels and just assume that that, that will be okay. But um, I also, in order to actually be able to do it, I have to be comfortable with that and find ways to do it. So just be non-defensive. I'm trying my hardest, but if someone says I've done something wrong, I just have to listen. Um, something I found really useful is the things that I think are brilliant. Um, sometimes maybe they're not. And just checking it with somebody first. So there's a neurodivergent colleague that I've been talking with and she, it was just so useful to show a form to her. And she just said, well, I'll just change that, that and that, and then I'll understand it. And it didn't occur to me that, that there were tiny things that needed changing, but made a huge difference to her. So obviously doing that before I sent it out was really, really useful. And then trying to build in processes to listen to criticism. So if somebody approaches me, obviously I'd need to be non-defensive, but they need to find ways to do that. And for the bit to sort of break down the, the barrier of this is the project, the untouchable, the academic, and ways for them to be able to put their input in and create those. I think you can't just wait for people to come and tell you what was wrong. I've got to be quite proactive in creating appropriate methods for that criticism. Because again, it was so I'm so used to in the academic community a lot of peer review, a lot of committee type working. So I work with great colleagues and we challenge each other all the time and we're perfectly comfortable with that. But in this kind of setting, it's going to be different. So that's really quite important. Um, I've got one minute left. Okay, it's my experience today. Today is the first day of my funding. So it's very exciting that I'm here today. Um, and this project in particular has been such a chicken and egg situation. So normally if I get a grant, it starts from the second, you know, you've got the grant or before that because you've written the application. But because I can't make any decisions until the co-production team are involved, I can't do anything. So it's like a weird kind of um, hiatus. I can't get too excited down one avenue because that's just my perspective of it. Um, so I can't put some concrete things in place. So I've been uh, really holding off, but it's exciting to get stuck in now. Um, early listening in adapting those ideas, because yes, undoubtedly I am still mind racing and building all these structures in my head. And you have to have some kind of structure. We can't just open the doors to the world and then try and work out what to do. So I'm going to present some kind of structure and then adapt that once people are in. So that's good. The stuff, this, this is the difficult bit, these last two then. So it's the balance between having the power so I do, I've got, I've got a job and I've got the resources and I've got the grant, um, but also giving that over to co-producers and, and genuinely letting them take 
control over those decisions and making putting the structures in place that they feel empowered to say no to me because I, I don't have the power. And that's that's actually a lot harder, um, well, easier said than done, I suppose, a lot harder to do than it is to say. And, and the flip side of it, so I've been working really hard at trying to get my head around that, about how to be unpowerful. And I was doing feeling quite good at that. But then the split side of that is the actual responsibility that I still feel. And that's why I struggle, I think, to give up the power. So this question of safe spaces, I'm inviting people in to talk about their lived experiences of racism or transgender experiences in a folk club. And I might be inviting them into a space with somebody who has more racist opinions. And, uh, and how do you balance that? Because I can't just invite them in and then say over to you. Huh, it's nothing to do with me. I do have a, a a, a role of responsibility here so I'm, I'm feeling genuinely conflicted in that how to do the power balance stuff and I think it is a responsibility of the whole team to do those safe spaces but um yeah that's partly where my my conflict is still at the minute so yeah my current issue is the terminology because things just move so fast and I'm trying to keep up but it's really hard so often I just avoid difficult phrases but that's going to get harder and harder as we work safe spaces making sure that I am responsible for people and then lastly, this recognizing my positionality, that's really huge for all of us. Um, and recognizing the impact that we have in research. And often there's a tendency then to try and remove ourselves and hand it all over to the rest. But I think that I'd like that to be my final message is that that's not the point of co-production, it's co. It's not just giving this project to other people. I'm an academic, my positionality is valid and is important and is necessary as part of the project as well. So it's not just about removing yourself and handing over power, it's about equalizing power and, and doing that as a collaborative co-produced project. So that is my project. I'd love any feedback either through this or privately um, through email. And I'm genuinely interested to, to make this a strong project. So um, anything is useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Faye, and congratulations and the best of luck to you as you start on this amazing journey. Um, any any questions or comments or reflections from, from anybody? Um, I'm just trying to keep a, a check on the on the chat. There's nothing coming in at the moment. Uh, when when I, I know you will have things to say, but maybe just to kick start it. I was really struck by the um, by the slide where you asked the questions of the working group, or you, at least you're setting them up to ask questions about and, and they were what we know and what we think we know and, and i just wanted to, to get your sense of how, what the difference is um be, because um th there's something there about well assumptions i suppose but i'd just get your, your sense of that yeah um my neurodivergent friend picked me up on exactly the same thing so in my head it's like one's kind of official and one's kind of personal or one's broadly. No, because yeah, this is a messy bit. So if anyone's got better ways of saying this, I think there's a difference between um, things that are proven, like women get paid X amount different to male colleagues on the English folk circuit. There's a, there can be a fact there in some data that is researched and found. Um, and whether that is done by academics or by industry people or the MU or whatever, that is different to a musician thinking they're paid less or probably more likely a musician thinking they're paid the same, <laughs> thinking there's no gender disparity in fees, but then actually the evidence suggests there is. So in my head, there's quite a big difference between those. Um, but I don't know how to clarify it, how, like how to draw those circles around it. But with that example, that seems different to me. I don't know. Have you got any ideas for me? No, I think I think it's a it's a big one, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about you know perhaps how we know what we know, and but 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 we you know the only way we know is we, we think, and you know it's 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 probably um, too 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 complex to talk to in, in this in a little soundbite. But it just struck me as something that actually probably could lead to um some sorts of conflicts because somebody is going to have to decide if you go down that road somebody's going to have to decide what counts as valid knowledge and that's probably not really what where you want to be uh, i'm just interested uh, in alexander alexander you've given them um, um a chat here and um would you like to would you like to put 
uh, turn on your microphone and just say it because I don't think Faye can see it. Oh, you? okay, sure. Um, well, um, yes, Faye, thank you very much um, and everybody. Um, great that these conversations are still happening. Um, we need them more than ever, um, but they're not going to get easier. And so just simply this word I'm about to use is itself now overused, wanted to show some gentle solidarity both the right word, but also a really misconstrued word in terms of, of the terminology. Um, nobody can keep up. I will say a little bit about this in my presentation, um, but I think it is time for some of us non-white persons to be a little bit more in your face about the fact that the approaches to changing terminologies, and then it's not just about race, but all types of identity frameworks which find themselves characterized or typologized, not a word, but you know what I mean. If the actual lexical, if the, the word, if the conceptual, if the linguistic reasons for various changes are insufficiently thought through, as I would argue almost all of them are right now, then it is inevitable that they will be supplanted for other things which are equally badly thought through and then the whole issue of things claiming to have been thought about, but then having not been thought about is academically bankrupt. And then people beating other people down for using the wrong terminology, which they haven't thought about, is also bankrupt, is ethically bankrupt. So there is no win here. We do the best we can. And that was all I was trying to communicate. Thank you, Mary. Um, just to show some solidarity in a way whilst being terribly afraid that even my use of that word in this context will be misinterpreted by some people who will be saying, what are you doing? Your job as a black person is to step on it and to ensure you see where I'm going with this. It's unsustainable. So we have real problems. We have real white fragility, but none of that has anything to do with the fact that much of the terminology changes are unsustainable and I would argue conceptually unsupportable. So doing great, good luck, look forward to hearing more and hang in there with all the people who keep telling you that you've gotten it wrong because sometimes they're right, but often they themselves have no idea how wrong they are. I would not shut up. Yeah. Faye, anything to, to respond to that? Or... I come over all emotional. That was just lovely. Thank you very much, Alexander. That's, that's the nicest thing that could have been said to me just now because that is, it's, it's, it's haunted me, like this thing of well, what should, like I am this white, northerner you know woman coming doing this research and um yeah you do feel like you're doing the wrong thing but if you don't do anything nothing happens does it so i'm just trying my hardest not to do it badly but uh, yeah thank you that was just utterly beautiful thank you great okay and we have um some some interesting um um information about wh where you might go for safe spaces Faye, which has come from emily emily have you used that particular um consultancy.co.uk is there anything that, that you want to give a heads up on or it was was that all you wanted to add um, i just wanted to share the results i don't know if you can hear me sorry there's a lot of background noise yeah there's a bit of back i think it's, is it a, a microphone a, a real microphone uh, can you hear me now i can hear you perfectly now yeah okay great um, I came across that through Dr. Muna Abdi. So she does a lot of research on decolonization within education. Um, that's a blog post uh, that someone else has written, but it just explores some of the ideas to do with safe spaces as a good starting point. I found it really useful in understanding it. That's great. I, I think that's that's uh, that sounds like a uh, I must go to Faye. Uh, it would appear. Um, now we have um, Shireen. You have made a point. I just haven't quite picked it up. Um, so maybe again, just because you're in the room, will, will you will you say it to us? It's just nice to hear voices. Um, yeah, Thank sure. You. I just I had um, actually just to follow up very quickly on safe spaces because I've been running them at Royal Holloway as well. And the kinds of safe spaces we've worked with have actually moved on. Um, and following the thinking of a few other scholars. Um, 
uh, and work of Thomas Hilda were moving towards brave spaces because apparently in safe spaces, um, everyone is sort of let's pet. There's 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 a time for that, but then in order to change, you have to move towards being more provocative and graduate. But there's different levels of working, so I, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, we're still figuring it out, but I actually had a question for Faye um, uh, about co-production when it comes to publications. Um, and I guess for a lot of academics, our stock in trade until very recently um, was basically you have to publish. Um, and a publication means a lot less to some of the interlocutors and consultants I work with on research projects um, in the community. But at the same time, I think they're really important to do. So I don't know if there are any um, methodologies or approaches that um, you are you're working on on this front and by publications I'm referring to not just pieces of academic text but maybe even performances that that you've spoken about um, but there's this whole looming specter of ref and and this whole idea of you know if your publication is not refable then there's um there's no point trying to do that but you know ref worthy stuff isn't necessarily the best kind of um formats for a lot of these communities so so i, I and then many other things um um post uh, eric lassiter at all who have written that big volume on collaborative ethnography like how do you represent and things in translation and like bad english um i mean i'm trying to to do things like screenshots and then maybe just put the raw material out there, contextualize and maybe in, you know, translations. But then, then this question of whose whose voice you present and how much do you translate, and do we provide so much context that there is no content? So um yeah, would be curious um, about your methodologies and maybe I could apply them too. Yeah. So with this one, obviously we're so early none of that's been discussed yet, but I did um, another HRC project, a Connected Communities one, which was co-produced with uh, three different music organisations in Sheffield. And we did quite a lot of co-writing and co-outputs and some not co-outputs as well. And so one of them was, oh God, what was it called now? Co-writing about co-production. It was all a little bit meta, um, but it kind of talked about the process of producing outputs collaboratively and how complicated it is. And it was four voices all muddled around. So that was in a book. Ooh, Joe Venkus was one of the editors. Uh, I can, I don't know. Yeah, if, email me if you're, if you're particularly interested. Um, I did it with Kate Parl as well, who's from the School of Education. She's a, a big co-production person. But basically our approach was, um, or the thing that I realised is that the, there's so many different kinds of outputs and you don't all have to have an equal share in every output. I can't play the fiddle, you know, or one of, one of my project manager can't play the fiddle, but she can do something else. And so I wouldn't expect to have a spot on a stage um, in somebody else's performance just because we're co-producing some research together and they shouldn't, I shouldn't expect them to be able to write the highest peer review academic article for a particular kind of journal following a particular kind of theoretical argument. And, and neither of us need to be able to do both things. What we need to do is to be able to create a project that satisfies all the things and bring what we can to it and make sure that our outputs reflect the whole project, not just then carve it back off into our own little worlds, but reflect the co-production of the project, but using our individual skills to the max. And then my opinion on REF is that the period is actually quite long and you only need a couple of items that are REF satisfactable. And so I would not try and make everything, I wouldn't I'd just forget about REF for most stuff, just do the outputs that are relevant for the project and think of one or two articles that you need to write that match the REF criteria and do them separately. But it shouldn't affect everything else, absolutely not. It is a consideration, you can't forget but it shouldn't affect every output. Um, and thank you very much, Faye. That's, uh, uh, yeah, that sounds great. And it'd be really lovely to hear how it progresses um, maybe at another other forum. So, uh, and thanks to everybody for the comments, which, which I think um, will be very useful to us. So um, just mindful of time, um, I'm going to move on to the, to the, um, the next presenter. 
and that's David Clark. Uh, and David is Professor of Music at Newcastle University. And his research includes music theory in its broadest sense, ranging from music analysis to the philosophy of music. Um, he sings in the Kayal's vocal style and has published on the analysis, aesthetics and cultural significance of Hindustani classical music. In collaboration with his vocal teacher Vijay Rashput and tabla maestro Shabazz Hussain, he has taught modules on Indian music to students at Newcastle University for some 15 years. So for, uh, thank you, David, and, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, it's, and thank you for in, inviting me to speak at this uh, at this forum. Um, so I'm just going to um, share my screen. There's an inevitable PowerPoint. Um, so just one second. Right. Okay. Um, and I just need to do the slideshow thing. Okay. Um, hopefully everybody can see that, um, so I will crack on. Yeah, I, I, not yet, not yet. Oh yeah, it's coming, yep, yeah, yeah, got it, yep. Yeah. Okay, cool, right, thanks. <clears throat> um, so I've called this talk um, Studying Indian Music and its Possibilities for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, and my aims are actually quite simple, which is to just to give a, a, a quick sketch of a short course on indie music that I teach at Newcastle University most years, uh, and I've been doing that since 2008. Um, <clears throat> and I want to consider then the implications uh, of this uh, for equality, diversity, inclusion uh, in the present day agenda, but also uh, looking back over um, the 14 year history actually of um, running this module. Uh, and uh, obviously part of that new context is recent initiatives and uh, to do with decolonizing the curriculum. <clears throat> um, so I want to just start by saying something about the backstory of this and in a way the, the backstory uh, is partly my, my own personal backstory and a, a pers so personal history but also uh, the, the history of uh, our, my own institution and department and inevitably these two things uh, get into, intertwined a bit. Um, so uh, to my own uh, uh, early mid-career, early to mid-career, um, much, much of my teaching and research was focused on Western classical music, um, theory, analysis and all of that. Um, but I've also had a long-standing interest in Indian classical music, which actually goes back to the time when I lectured uh, at Dartington College of Arts uh, back in the late 1980s. I was again lecturing on Western stuff, but Indian music was in the air there. Um, and, but it wasn't until the late 1990s, uh, under a kind of bizarre um, set of circumstances, that I did begin then to, to actually to learn Indian classical music. Um, first of all on violin, which is my, used to be my main instrument, but then uh, pretty soon moved on to vocal. And since 2004, <clears throat> my principal teacher has been Dr. Vijay Rajput, who's a Kyle vocalist. Uh, and here's a little picture of Vijay and me. I'm lucky uh, from time to time to accompany him in recitals he gives, which is a fantastic way to learn. Um, and it's always an honour to sit alongside such a fantastic performer. Um, so that moment in my life actually coincided with the moment in the history of, of the department where I've taught now for 30 years, um, uh, around, around the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, and this was uh, what we sometimes refer to as the Middleton area when Richard Middleton uh, joined us as professor, um, as my predecessor there. Uh, and uh, during that period, we introduced uh, some radical changes in the curriculum and the culture of our department, including the introduction uh, of a popular and contemporary degree program, a folk and traditional tr uh, degree program, which I think Faye Heald knows quite well. Um, a, a, a study abroad program, uh, and also we, re we entirely restructured internally uh, our um, sort of BA music in music program, which was the one uh, where classical music has traditionally resided and used to be predominantly uh, Western classical music based program, uh, so no longer. So in a way, perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, we might so be partly decolonized ourselves then, uh, though clearly we're at a different moment now and there's still lots to be done. Um, and the one term that we use quite a lot during that period and since uh, has been less um, um, diversity, uh, but at the time uh, we were concerned about theorizing plurality and cultural pluralization. And obviously these terms interconnect quite a bit. 
uh, and hand in hand with that went a big expansion of the department, probably like most departments who've done similar things um, since then, um, with uh, more diversified staff, at least in terms of expertise and um, epistemologies and so on. So it's been an interesting uh, and in some ways quite challenging time, but challenging in a good way. Um, now, against that background, um, clearly uh, um, a, a, a field like Indian classical music um, might have an obvious place uh, if you're trying to diversify and pluralise your curriculum. Um, as it turned out, we only formally adopted it into our curriculum uh, in the late um, noughties, uh, around about 2008. And part of the reasons, I think, for the delay there uh, are to do with capital. Uh, first of all, I would say perhaps my own intellectual capital, which I had to develop a bit because I was still doing, doing this slightly on the sly at the time as a kind of hobby in the, in the background uh, of, of my day job. Um, so I was sort of still um, boning up about uh, a lot of stuff there and also trying to improve my own expertise as a practitioner. Uh, but also the, the usual capital in the more usual financial sense in, in that these things cost money. And it took probably till about 2008 to be able to uh, have the resources necessary to do it the way that I wanted to do it. Uh, and that came when uh, we were part of a, we, in fact, we led a, a Centre for Excellence in Teaching and Learning uh, for Music Inclusivity, which uh, was uh, ran between 2005 and 2010, and actually brought us, had a lot of money attached to it. So it meant we had quite a lot of fun, did interesting stuff. And this was one of the things that um, it was possible to do. And uh, to the great credit of um, you know people in charge of where I work, um, uh, subsequent my, this work has subsequently become embedded in our curriculum. So it's a kind of pretty long-standing thing now. Um, so I should say a little bit about the course that I teach, uh, in other words, module. Um, I call the, the key module is one called Indian Music in Practice, and it's offered to second year undergraduates. And there's also possible, it's also possible for students to do a follow on uh, in their final year. Um, and also do a version of it for master students too. Uh, and they can go in at any, at any level of experience. But the important thing is also to make um, this group of learners try and function as a single community around this activity. Um, so that in itself brings quite a lot of diversity and heterogeneity into the mix. Um, uh, plus the fact that we have students uh, at undergraduate level from all, all our different programmes. So we get folk students, uh, you might get drummers, uh, people, students who play in band, people who play the viola, uh, all uh, sitting next to each other. Um, my, most of them learning this kind of music for the first time. Um, the word practice in the title of this module, Indian Music in Practice, has been really, really the crucial one. And my strap line for this module is that students learn about Indian music by doing it. So really, perhaps a more precise idea there might be the idea, the notion of praxis. In other words, practice informed by theory and knowledge, and conversely, knowledge and theory informed by practice. Um, so that's been pretty crucial to the ethos of what I've been trying to do. Um, to make this module possible at all, uh, I've uh, been worked in collaboration with uh, my own teacher, Vijay Rajput, and uh, Shabazz Hussain, who's a fantastic tabla player. So, uh, and I have to keep reminding our students how lucky they are to have these fantastic teachers and fantastic performers who perform on the international stage. Um, so we're incredibly lucky to have them. And, um, we've worked together, the three of us, on the different aspects of this module over the whole time, and uh, they've been such uh, great people to work with. So, um, and obviously, it's brought them into our department too. So that's been a pretty important thing to have happen. Uh, part of the deal of the module uh, is that students don't have to have any, have any prior experience of, of doing Indian music. Um, so students come to it for a variety of reasons. Um, they get 20, about 20 half-hour lessons over the course of an academic year in small groups uh, on uh, either vocal or tabla, they can get to choose. Uh, and we make realistic expectations about the assessment. Um, the aim is not to turn them all into virtuoso vocalists or tabla players, but to use those mediums, uh, voice or uh, drums, uh, to experience Indian music. and. Uh, to experience it as a cultural process. So the process becomes as important as what they finally deliver. <clears throat> and uh, the crucial aim really is to try and cultivate cultural understanding 
for the students that uh, take this module. So this is the theoretical aspect of what I've called praxis. Uh, so in, in a way, in my imagination anyway, um, and in terms of the narrative that I present to students, uh, I stage this course as a kind of cultural encounter, um, taking Phil Wellman's idea about what ethnomusicology is trying to investigate. And at the heart of um, the module is the notion of the guru shishya parampara. So the guru is the teacher, shishya is the student or disciple, and parampara means um, lineage or tradition. So although it's in the, in the context of obviously these days a corporatized uh, university and a modularized degree structure, um, the idea is at least to give, to give the students at least some kind of taste of traditional ways of learning literally sitting at the feet of a guru uh, and uh, taking tuition, the term known in Hindi uh, as Talim. And the other key concept is Riyaz, is this kind of approach to practice, which has a kind of element of uh, devotion or particular kind of commitment to it. <clears throat> um, so these and other notions um, are ideas that we also explore on the theoretical side in seminars. Uh, which I lead, and uh, in, those, in those seminars we look at aspects of theory, um, the kind of knowledge that practitioners would have in this field. So uh, it's an expectation that students know certain kind of uh, Hindi, Urdu, Sanskrit terms. Uh, and then added to that, I try and give the students some kind of introduction to the cultural and history of this music. Um, again, the stuff that um, tradition, uh, that practitioners would, would know having grown up in that culture. Um, so I have to kind of fast track and accelerate that process. Also importantly, to give students tools for reflection. And one way that I've sometimes done this is to encourage them and in fact assess them on the writing of a blog. Um, and also I try to encourage students to think about this experience of ethnomusicology as if this were a kind of piece of field work that they were doing over the course of an academic year. And so I give them um, some selected reading from uh, new, new ethnomusicologies, from autoethnography and uh, those kind of things. So that's a, a quick thumbnail of uh, what we teach. And in the last few minutes, I just want to try and pull out some of the things that, it, that might make it significant potentially for uh, EDI. And there are three, I think three main themes I want to pull out. So the first of these is the notion of representation. What do we represent? What musics do we represent? What epistemology is? Uh, what approaches do we represent in our degree programmes? So um, this module contributes to diversity in that respect, in terms of music that are represented in, in the curriculum, uh, an ex increase, I hope, in global awareness, a different, an increase in understanding of different kinds of music uh, and different uh, kinds of theory and different kinds of epistemology. Um, uh, as a kind of caveat to this before I get too kind of pleased about it, um, uh, I came across once again this quotation from David Grammett, who says, to be sure, in most uh, departments, uh, courses in other musics exist and may even be required of majors, but they most often remain peripheral both in terms of role in the curriculum and the staff representation. Um, so you can read the rest of the quote at your leisure, but um, he's, he's cautious here that in a way these things aren't just seen as gestures. Um, and my hope here is that in our own curriculum at least we have got a bit beyond that. Um, the last time I quoted this I realised today was in a, in a critical musicology forum in the days when there was such a thing. Um, in 2002, so 20 years ago, we convened, that group convened, uh, to discuss, again, the diversification and pluralisation of the curriculum. So there's an interesting little piece of institutional history there. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, the second um, strand that I think is important and uh, perhaps useful, uh, might have some wider applicability, is the notion of, of experiential learning. In other words, the in-practice bit. Uh, of this module, uh, that students learn by doing and musicians, by definition, often are engaged in practice. So this, I think there's some real value in the hands-on doing and practicing of music that, may, that for many will be um, in some way otherly. Uh, and here um, I, I've got a quotation from Michelle Kisliuk from, from her, uh, her chapter Undoing Musicology, sorry, Undoing Fieldwork. 
uh, which is one of the texts I encourage students to read from time to time. And Kislyuk says, we continually move back and forth from experience to a perspective on cultural process and back again until the intellectual and experiential come together. And for me, that's very much uh, a useful kind of uh, ethos for doing this kind of work. Um, and also importantly, because of our participation in performance, ethnomusicologists are especially aware that there is much one can only know by doing. So again, there's something important here that actually doing gives a, a particular kind of knowledge that's perhaps embodied, embodied uh, and about face-to-face -face, uh, transaction uh, that can't be gotten any other way. Uh, and finally, uh, there, is, there, there is the potential to contributing to uh, what we've called decolonizing the curriculum across the board, um, and uh, which obviously since the, uh, the uh, resurgence of, of uh, debate around the black, whole Black Lives Matter issue, uh, has become uh, has acquired a new kind of urgency. So, uh, in my own response to that, in, as a way of trying to contribute to these uh, initiatives, um, I incorporated some sessions uh, that situate Hindustani, North Indian classical music against the backdrop of imperialism and colonization in the Indian subcontinent. And so, there are three particular classes I do. Obviously, I'm trying to squeeze a lot into a pint pot here. Um, but I uh, look at the uh, Mughals and uh, looking back prior to that, the long-standing historical presence of Muslims in India, which is, I think, a pretty important point to uh, discuss. Uh, I look at the role of, then of the British and uh, uh, not only the British Raj, but before that, the English East India Company. And then in the final session, we look at uh, what was going on in India's move to independence, independence and decolonization. Uh, and all of those things, uh, I try to uh, look at the uh, the role of music in all of that. Um, so, part of my intent here, um, and I think this may also be solitary, is to try and give a long view of empire, um, going right back to medieval era um, uh, and of colonisation in India. It has a, I'm sure everybody knows this, but it has a long India has a long, complex history of, of colonisation and imperialism. Um, and also, I try to give uh, a geographic wide angle, looking at Eurasia, so right across um, the, the the continent. Um, so the the importance of Persian culture, for example, on, on uh, South Asian culture, uh, and so on. And then also to try and make students aware of, of the, some of some of the historical complexities as a way of trying to understand some of the fraught issues around um, decolonization and the British. Uh, British domination and entanglements in, for example, debates between Hindu and Muslim culture. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, so there is a message there about uh, not not taking trying to take a simplistic approach to any of this. Uh, my approach is partly factual. I just want to encourage students simply to learn what happened in one sense. Uh, if that doesn't sound too uh, naive, uh, but also. Um, I want to take an approach that's critical. I'm not attempting to give a kind of balanced picture of British involvement where there has to be some kind of counter argument that says, oh yeah, but the British brought the railways to India. Um, so the premise is that the, the uh, position is critical from the start. But what's also interesting is, it, um, and perhaps, perhaps quite obvious, that students can work it out for themselves actually. Once they start reading some of the things that happened, uh, then you don't have to push too hard uh, to generate um, the right kind of mindset, I think. So, and one thing that's taught me is that maybe just simply learning about colonialism uh, might be a better or perhaps less um, uh, high temperature term than decolonizing the curriculum. Um, by simply learning about it, then um, uh, the decolon some of the some aspects of decolonization might take care of itself. Uh, and finally, um, the experiential dimension is is important as well. So. Um, having got the students to look at this historical stuff, I asked them to consider how they square that up with their actual practical experience of learning Indian music. Uh, and I just wanted to quote from one student who was a master student who did this uh, uh, last year. And this is a quotation from her essay. She's given me permission to encourage that and, and to, um, to quote this and also wanted to be named. So I've named her. Um, and she says here, receiving lessons from a guru on an instrument allows students contact with Indian culture while the provenance is clear. 
The guru, as a representative of the Gurana, and that's the tradition, is passing on their knowledge unconstrained, which stands in great, great contrast to both the looting in India performed by the British and the partially questionable exhibits in the museums of Britain and continental Europe. The guru has complete control over the knowledge they share. This could stand as a symbolic way to give back power to the practitioners of Indian culture after the traumatic power imbalance between India and the British Empire. So I thought that was one particularly thoughtful kind of um, uh, contribution. Um, and that's just one example of uh, what was said. So I think one important of all of this uh, that uh, I hope I'm making some gesture at doing is helping uh, students and uh, others to to face up to uh, the past, which I think is an important aspect of decolonization. Um, and um, there's perhaps a notion that in doing this, in practicing Indian music in its own terms, on its own terms, in other words, with the gurus um, sort of front and center of the process, that this might be in some way reparative. So that's me. Thank you very much, David, for that very thought-provoking presentation. Um, lots there to consider. Um, uh, we have we have some time for questions or comments. If anybody would like to um, raise a hand or just uh, put something in the chat. The um, yeah, when when you're doing that, I'm just interested in, in uh, as an educator. Um, just my, my antenna went up when you mentioned about learning about colonialism instead of decolonizing the the curriculum and I, and I just wondered did it have to be either or David or how, how might it work if you were doing both and uh yeah I think of it as both and I mean I, I'd see it you know <laughs> as, as uh, part of the decolonizing the curriculum process I mean I'm on, I've been on our working party in the department so um certainly yeah it's part of that um uh but it seems to me that um, in some ways, just one really useful thing is just for students to learn about co about colonialism. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested. Push too hard, I don't think. Sorry, David, I beg your pardon. I thought you were finished. Sorry. So we, we, I don't think we have to push too hard to get, to get certain messages over and to raise consciousness. I think mean, once they start to read about it, you know, if you give them the suitable text, then uh, it, um, their responses are actually quite uh, illuminating and uh, actually quite enlightening, I think. Yeah. And just one quick one uh, for me as well, if, if, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned that they have 20 minute sessions. Um, presumably that's the, every week. That is, does that sort of go throughout the semester or the term or however it works? And yeah. Can you talk, talk me through a little bit how, how it works in practice? Um, um, in practice, it's actually quite complicated to organize, but um, uh, yeah, we basically they have, the students have half an hour uh, a week in term time, um, so it's, it's predicated on the area of little and often, um, so that they see their teacher regularly, um, and um, we run the module across two terms basically. So from basically from October through to about April. Uh, I mean, I would do it for longer, but you know, it's actually quite expensive to do. I mean, this is my point about you know needing the finance to bring in two uh, top class performers and uh, teach the students all the time. I, I'm keep waiting for the tap on the shoulder where I'm going to be told I can't keep on doing this, but I mean, I've got away with it for a while. Yeah, and does it ever in, does it ever sort of uh, lead to the students taking on you know further outside of the the university, um, you know, taking up out. Uh, lessons with the guru or with with the teacher, you know, developing outside of the formal structures of the of the course, I suppose. Yeah, one or two of them have done that at least for a while, and um, interestingly, um, a number of them have integrated it into their practice, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, so in other words, into if, if for example, the studio composers, uh, then they um, might integrate some of these sounds into their into their work as well, mm -hmm. um, and. I think what's useful about that is that they're, you know, they're doing it now with insight rather than just in an appropriative way. You know, that oh, I'd like some tabla beats, so I'll just kind of, you know, sample some and stick some in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these students have actually learned the tabla and understand what's going on, and then perhaps can manipulate their system in a creative way. Uh, or, for example, we had a, a one guy who was a drummer, a kit drummer, and um, he produced actually quite a thoughtful piece of research on. Um, 
transferring notions of tabla playing and tabla strokes um, across onto the drum kit and um, about the kind of cultural journey that that involved. So that's really quite a thoughtful piece of work. So uh, yeah. it plays out in all sorts of ways, actually. Yeah, that cross virtualization must be must be really uh, enriching um, across the the department or wherever it sits. Um, that it's not just in a little in a little silo somewhere. That it actually does become embedded into the whole um, ethos, if you like, of the place, which sounds really great. Um, thank you. A anybody else have any comments, or shall we move on? Great. Well, that seems to be that seems to have. Um, Mary, I think Alexander's got his hand up. I oh, think. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, Alexander. I I didn't. Uh, yeah, go for it. I, I don't I don't see you, so I beg your pardon. Sure, no problem. Um, thanks very much. Um, so this is just a quick one, and not to press it negatively, but it is a serious question. Um, David, I'm wondering if it's possible for you to flesh out conceptually what you have in mind when you raise the possibility of. Um, activity being reparative. How how does that look in 2022 um, as something that functions beyond language itself? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, interestingly, Alexander, I mean, like th that word just came into my brain a few days ago when I was thinking you know, about this. That um, I think it's it's trying to um, Actually, in some ways, I think the, the, the quotation we saw from the student that I, I quoted from um, probably says, says it as clearly as anything I can say that, um, I mean, one thing the British didn't steal uh, from India and from South Asia was their music, actually, this, this way of making music, um, because probably because many of them didn't understand it. Um, so um, that didn't really get appropriated in the way that um, I think um, tangible objects were stolen. Um, and um, so I think that to give this music, to make this music audible in one's own department and, and to bring it into the curriculum, and for me it's been important to bring, um, as it were, tradition bearers like BJG and Shabazz in to do it. Um, uh, I, it's a way of, of bringing it in and giving it a place where um, the students themselves uh, are uh, are treating the teachers as authorities in some way. So my hope would be it's a kind of gesture of, of uh, sort of mending something actually by, by 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 showing this music that it has some kind of importance. And personally, when I've been to India. Um, I found um, you know, people intensely interested in the fact that I sing Kayal. I mean, I don't sing it very well, but the fact that I'm doing it at all. Um, and I mean, it's never explicit, but I think there's some sense that, oh, okay, that people are pleased that you're taking this music seriously in some way. Um, and that, you know, that you're putting yourself through the Guru Shisha Parampara, right, which is not a picnic. Um, so it's quite a rigorous, strenuous learning process. So you can't appropriate music, I don't think, if you're doing that, because the, the teachers won't let you. Um, so I think in that sense, I feel there's perhaps some kind of reparative potential in there. That it, the, it gives this music its due, shows its importance, it shows respect for it, and it's brought in uh, and um, yeah, dealt with in that kind of way. Yeah. Great. I, I'm go there's a, another hand up um, from Roxana. Hi. Yeah, I'm aware there's not much time, but I just quickly wanted to say, um, leading on from what you just said, David, I think a nice way to pair that non-appropriation of the music is with teaching about colonialism rather than um, attempting to decolonialize the curriculum. Because um, we, we all know the discussion of, is that even possible? Um, but I think just the fact of teaching about colonialism is really interesting and that perhaps should be pressed more, especially with other musics. Um, your module really reminds me of my own artographic project I did myself. I took it upon myself to do as my master's thesis about Iranian music. Um, and it does make me wonder if more institutions should have modules about different musics in the same way you're doing, not just about the music, but with real life experience and um, about the colonial history as well. It's really fascinating and um, 
I imagine you've got many more positive examples of student experiences. Uh, thanks. Yeah, there are some more. And I mean, this was only the first year I've done it in Kuwait, you know, made the colonial aspect so explicit. Um, so it, it was really interesting to do that. And I'm doing it again this year. And we will see how it pans out. But yeah, thank, well, thanks for your encouragement. Yeah. And, and actually, just allied to that, just one final question from, from Jonathan, who has um, put in the chat. Uh, Jonathan, if you're here, maybe, maybe you could just say it. If you could unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. thank you very much. That would be great. Yeah. Great. No, yeah, thanks for sharing it. I, I really liked that the student example that you shared. I mean, I think um, just bouncing off from that discussion, I was just curious if you've had experiences where um, there was not so positive experiences with students. And if it did happen, how did you manage those, those examples or those situations? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, actually, I didn't sort of get a negative response from students, actually. Um, and I'm not being self congratulatory about that, and I just didn't. But I mean, it's possible that to, to, to a degree, um, the process is self selecting because it's an optional module. So the students that take it are going to be positive, I think, positively inclined towards the music anyway. I guess what I have, what I may have noticed is that, you know, obviously, you know, across a, a cohort of students, um, you're going to get a whole range of backgrounds and uh, attitudes and what have you. So um, some students find it more, I think, a bit more uh, challenging than others. Uh, you know, it's a kind of an acculturation process or as a cultural encounter. So it's possible that some of them don't get it. And in fact, I encourage them, you know, if they don't get it, I just encourage them to try and be authentic, you know, because there's learning to be had there. Um, so, uh, and I suspect some of them don't get it and aren't being authentic with me and they're still telling me what they will think I want to hear. So uh, this is just a bit, it just perhaps goes to the point about a safe space really, you know, um, that I would like them to feel safe to, to say, oh, I find this, does, it, this does my head in. You know, actually I did have one teacher, one student said, oh, person X does my head in. It's like, okay, let's talk about that. So sometimes you get that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's possible that um, obviously the, uh, and this is perhaps part of the bigger issue around the whole decolonization agenda that students who may struggle with it are not going to sp speak. So that's why I sort of try to take a slightly um, not to not totally proactive approach, but simply like, okay, let's just read, let's just read this stuff and see what you make of it. Um, yeah. There any kind of finger wagging like you know, British bad, Indians good, you know, because it's just so much more complex than that anyway. Yeah, it's, it's it's a great question, I, I, um, and obviously um, further, we haven't got the time to continue it, but there's obviously lots to continue. Um, thank you very, very much indeed, um, David, for that presentation and, and to everybody who's um, contributed to the discussion. So, so that's the, we've had our, our two presentations, um, and now for sort of between now and six o'clock, we're going to have hopefully time for quick, short, um, informative sessions, just updates on um, various um, organizations, associations connected with, with EDIMS. So we have four of these. Um, so I'm just invite Alexander um, just to start. Alexander has, um, is currently a lecturer, Alexander Douglas, is currently a lecturer in popular music in BIM Institute in Manchester and leads on EDI for um, both the British Forum for Ethnomusicology and the RMA Music Philosophy Study Group. He's also currently leading a project on anti-racism for the Society for the Social History of Medicine. And he has recently become a more senior member of the editorial board for Contemporary Music Review. So Alexander, um, you're speaking about the um, BFE EDI Working Group. Thanks. So maybe about five to 10 minutes, Alexander. Thank you very much. I will do my best to be succinct. Um, and there is a sense in which the news is uh, complicated. Complicated, of course, is a euphemism that um, is used for, well, the more positive side of that spectrum and occasionally for the less positive side of that, of that spectrum. And in this instance, um, both apply. Perhaps time constraints notwithstanding, um, a little bit of context um, for what will follow um, is important. I applied to 
become the EDI lead for the BFE, for the British Forum for Ethnomusicology, hereafter BFE. Less because I had an interest in the sort of, um, I'll use this carefully but seriously, posturing um, pseudo-didacticism um, where someone like me tells other people who don't look like me how to be allies. And something in my case that was rather more about how the disciplinary or the disciplinary praxis, um, so that praxis in that more serious sense of the word of the term could, could possibly be impacted for better. And was there a possibility that here in the UK, um, our British ethnomusicology community without imposing Britishness on any of these scholars where that's not appropriate, um, was that something that we could aspire to? At that time, I thought it was. The reason why I am very much less sure now that this is the case um, goes back to my earlier use of the word intractable. So it's unfortunately a low hanging fruit example, but I remain the only black person that I know who is actually part of the BFE. So we still need to see whether or not we're going to be able to find a way to survey our membership to ascertain something that at, the pre at present we can't. But the issue is not to focus on one specific EDI issue with a very particular dimension. It's the fact that the structures of disciplinary praxis in ethnomusicology here in the UK may open in some directions that, for example, we may not see in the US, but at the same time, they also close some things down, which doesn't give me a huge amount of hope for certain constituencies becoming more involved, more visible, more present in the way that this discipline is understood and practiced. Now, the sidestep to this, um, maybe most people here do not follow American football, but it was interesting that the BBC did screen a discussion about a lawsuit that's taking place um, courtesy of an American football player who is suing a number of very important uh, hierarchies in the NFL, well, in, in, in American football. And the point was made by one of the commentators that when black quarterbacks finally got a chance to play the quarterback position, they had to stand out. And if they didn't, then they didn't last very long. And so there was no scope for them to be ordinary. They had to be excellent. I am not sure that at this moment, the fact that there are so many important voices in the BFE community with commitments to widening the framework of representation, I mean, that's only good, but there is a sense in which what is giving me genuinely serious headaches is the fact that individual stakeholders within the EDI, in the pluriverse, shall we call it, are very good at ex explicating the issues that they understand but not necessarily connecting those to other issues within the EDI pluriverse. So the conversations continue to remain effectively a series of rectangles, if you'll pardon the obvious Zoom pseudo analogy, um, where people loudly and more quietly campaign for certain things. But this, isn't yet becoming a more critically synthesized and unified front by which we understand more of what is undermining genuine equality and equity, diversity and inclusivity here in the UK. Now, in principle, this is what everybody wants. 
So as I wind up my small spiel, I'd like to reflect on um, a 1930 statement, um, circa 1930, published in 1948 um, by Einstein, in which paraphrasing, he suggested that the thinking that has caused the problems we experience at a given moment is not going to be sufficient to turn over those problems. And at this time, what has happened is that the BFE working group for EDI has identified a number of, of critical areas. There is an anti-racism statement that I think we've got a huge job to actually get the language traction for that to make any kind of sense. We've still got issues in BFE communities about whether we should use B BGM um, as opposed to BAME. That's an important conversation, but then the problem of course is still that it should be easier for us in my case, or, or as far as I can see, to understand that black only applies in the West. So there is a, a lethal incongruity between black and global majority. Why isn't that more straightforwardly understood? But then your experience of being whatever you are that isn't white in a minority context is obviously different to when you are not in a minority context. So that's an example of where I don't see consensus on one thing called taxonomy is happening anytime soon. And what does that mean for our actual ability to solve more deeply entrenched problems, issues such as accents of people who may be ethnically white, but still find themselves otherwise marginalized, viewpoints of people whose approach to gender identity may have a flexibility that others appear to be unable to manage, and generally the still dependence on linear logocentrism that itself creates hindrances for unpicking the ways in which academic praxis continue to contribute to inequity. So my hope in 2022 is that somehow we can find ways to raise the stakes for rep people reporting on issues that are not, not wonderful examples of practice. And I've had some private correspondence from people who say that they would love to report something when we get our formal reporting tool up and running but they think they won't because they are too afraid that the wrong people will see their report and that they will be kickbacks that they cannot afford. And some of those accounts have been very heartbreaking to read. Why is that in 2022? Mm -hmm. And how is trust going to be built in ways that actually mean something to all stakeholders? Not sure. But let's see how we can go further to answering those questions this calendar year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Alexander. Um, hopefully we'll get to explore some of those questions in the discussion. But let's go on to the second the second um, speaker for this um, section, and that's Rachel. Rachel Cowgill is Professor of Music and University Research Theme Champion for Creativity at the University of York. Her research focuses on music in and as cultural history. And she's working on a number of um, funded research projects at the moment. She has been vice president of the RMA and chair of the National Association for Music in Higher Education. She's a former editor in chief of the journal of the Royal Musical Association and co-founding editor of the book series, Music in Britain, 1600 to 2000. She's chair of the RMA LGBTQI music study group and leads the resources working group for EDIMS. So Rachel, thank you. You're talking, aren't you, Rachel, about um, the resources working group and the music study group? Yeah, I, I thank you very much, Mary. And um, I'm just very impressed by uh, the presentations we've had so far. And personally, I would have liked to have done David's module any day as part of my degree. So it was great to hear about that. And thanks to everyone who's gone before. Um, I've been asked to talk about the LGBTQ plus music study group, which is um, it's it's an international group, a genuinely international group, which developed out of the Royal Musical Association LGBTQ plus 
music study group. Um, there was a feeling, I think, that um, the UK focus of the RMA and perhaps also some frictions and tensions that um, emerged as the group was, was setting up around some of the issues to do with identity and equality at that point, um, led the uh, group to move out of the RMA into a, a sort of more free floating um, presence uh, within the music community. Um, and also, of course, to be um, very open in its um, uh, brief so that uh, it wasn't specifically about academic music, it wasn't specifically about HE or research, it was about queer identity within music in its many forms. Um, and um, the group developed a, a sort of three prong purpose, which um, is beautifully uh, set out in the mission statement. So just for clarity, <clears throat> I want to highlight this um, lovely bit of prose here that we put together in the early years. Um, first of all, um, that uh, the purpose of the group was to promote academic inquiry, um, both in terms of self-presentation as a, a queer musician or a queer artist, but in terms of also studying how LGBTQ plus identities play out um, in the context of musics of different traditions and different locations. So there was very much a sort of sense that um, it was an environment in which people uh, would be engaged in queer musicology, but also uh, composition and performance that perhaps in some ways, either deliberately or as a reflection of its nature, commented on or, or shed some light on uh, queer identities. So that was one element of, of the, uh, the brief we, um, uh, we follow through with. And the second one was very much, it's already been talked about um, today, but very much about creating a safe space. And I totally, um, I'm fascinated by this development of the idea of brave space, um, uh, moving out of that um, and its uh, function as a means of enabling people to come together and to discuss uh, often deeply personal um, issues uh, in the form of embodied epistemologies um, and to be brave and, and challenging in the way we develop our knowledge and understanding um, of, of, of this area of work. Um, it's also, uh, sorry, this is my dog running around upstairs. I have, don't know if you can hear this, but there's a lot of thundering going on upstairs and down the stairs, apologies. So yes, a safe space, a brave space, but also a support system for those of us working within music who um, are uh, non-heteronormative in our outlook, uh, who are queer, um, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and who feel that by coming together, there's a shared understanding um, and, and a sense of uh, a, a, an ability to um, bring to the surface some of the needs of uh, queer musicians uh, within our own particular communities. Um, and then also uh, there's a, a really interesting aspect to the organization as well, which is that it provides or, or offers um, a, a consulting uh, function so that organizations who are wanting to look at uh, issues around diversity and representation can come to LGBTQ um, music study group and learn more about the conversations happening among musicians to do with um, uh, identity uh, representation, um, the opportunity to have one's work heard in the areas and arenas in which one would like uh, to, to find or feel one had a voice. So those are three main uh, purposes for the group. And it's, in my sense, um, in my experience, it's delivered really well on those three points and uh, it has delivered a whole range of really exciting and stimulating activities. I know we don't have much time, but I will just sort of flick through these so and give you an idea of the type of work that's been, uh, that it's been doing. Something I'd also like to do is to clarify the relationship between this group, this larger, more international group, and the um, RMA, LGBTQI plus study group. Actually, there's no plus in the RMA study group. Um, I could talk a bit about that if, if that would be useful. The, um, the international group is um, obviously free floating and it draws membership from all over. So um, whatever anybody's particular back background or connection with the topic of queer music, uh, that, that organization is open to you and to, of you to participate in events. Um, I'm pretty confident that everything we've done has been free. Um, and so that's another important point around EDI and access. 
um, but it is very much supported by the music organisations with which we're familiar. So the SMI, Buffy, the SMA, the RMA, and um, the Institute for Composer Diversity. Um, so that's good because it get, then represents again a, a diversity in terms of people's perspectives within uh, music studies broadly. Um, the RMA Music Study Group represents uh, RMA members um, in terms of giving um, LGBTQI members of the RMA a voice, but it also promotes scholarship uh, and practice um, in queer studies. Um, but it's within the sort of context of the Royal Musical Association and as part of what Laudan's going to talk about, the um, approach to uh, diversity within the RMA. Um, okay, so briefly, um, so this is the website. Um, you can see the, the, the link up there. So do um, have a good old look through uh, this material because there's a lot of thought gone into it and uh, gives you uh, an idea of the range and, and breadth of activities that we've, we've gone in for. Uh, we hold a symposium, um, oh, I should tell, us, tell you that the committee have their statements under that heading, I won't go into that now, but I will just uh, highlight the fact that the chair of the LGBTQ plus music study group is Thomas Hilda, um, and has uh, been doing exceptional work leading the group um, and exploring ways in which the group um, can become energetic and dynamic and, and lead itself. So we've been sort of experimenting with different uh, ways of organizing ourselves, which has been really interesting as well. So symposia, we've had symposia, um, obviously you can see the gap there from C19, but we've had um, symposia at various uh, locations. The next one, and I'll flag this up for anybody who's interested, um, is gonna be in Vienna. Uh, I'm not sure of the date just yet, but it's pretty soon. Um, and that is either going to be in person, uh, if you want to attend in person, you can, but it will also be delivered online simultaneously. So it enables a, a sort of hybrid um, um, way of access. So people, wherever your location is, you can, and if you can't travel to Vienna, you can still access the organization's um, meeting. Um, and those are really lovely events. We did one online last year, um, and there was a fairly small group of attendees and we constructed the whole day around readings and issues and emotively uh, dealing with different issues like anger, for example, um, uh, and, and identity and representation at different stages of the day, all inspired by particular readings that we put forward. Uh, so it was a really exciting um, event. Projects we've done, uh, some really lovely stuff here again, it seems to be my phrase for the day, really lovely. Um, moving kinship with dancer and choreographer Beatrice Allegranti. This is all about um, embodiment and emotion. And there's been some wonderful work. I didn't participate myself, but some wonderful work done with Beatrice um, in the context of the group's activities this year. Um, LGBTQ plus History Month 2021. Uh, this was Sound and Music uh, got in touch with us and um, asked uh, if we would um, collaborate with them in helping them to uh, raise the profile of um, queer artists who are represented within sound and music, sound and music, and particularly the uh, British um, music collection. So there were some blogs, there were some invited um, addresses, and and some interesting work around uh, metadata uh, done in the context of different uh, events, including a hackathon. Uh, Trans Radio UK again, some work there that's going on uh, with Trans Radio UK around representation. Um, and submissions uh, for um, music and projects uh, to be co covered and represented by uh, Trans Radio UK um, and Classical Queer simultaneously. We have been developing work with Classical Queer, a podcast database and online archival space to promote queer plus music, plus representing the um, extent of, uh, or the, the breadth of identity under that heading. We've been promoting a mutual mentoring program as well, which has been a really interesting development. And thanks to many of the people who are here today, um, I think has been very successful. There was a lot of discussion about what model we should take on, the power dynamics, the hierarchies that can often be um, problematic in the context of mentoring uh, schemes. And we've, uh, we've been working in that space um, in a way that's hopefully mutually reinforcing and supporting. Podcasts, um, particular highlight here, uh, I think in the resources that we've been producing over the last few years, 
Um, you can see there that there are seven uh, podcasts. They are free. They're exciting, I think. They cover a whole range of different activities. Some, have come, some of them coming out of specific publications or recordings, uh, addressing particular themes. And a bit like the Listening Project, there's this sense of dialogue and discussion that I, I mean, it's been wonderful to participate in, but I think really makes for a lovely um, listening experience that is brilliant teaching material, actually. Um, I've often set a couple of these for seminars as sort of proprietary work um, for students to get interested in the topic and methods and different perspectives. Um, the blog, again, some really exciting blogs in, in there. And then there's an open invitation um, with everybody to work with us. We're very open to other organisations collaborating with us and developing projects. Um, that's very much uh, uh, something that we're keen to advocate. Um, so that's uh, just a little run through of what we do. Um, I think there will be more updates to the website shortly because we only had a committee meeting uh, last week. Um, so watch this space. And if I'm going to use this space uh, for a plug, allow me to plug the Vienna Stroke Hybrid Symposium, um, which will be advertised soon and will be running later this year. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, okay, and the third of our four speakers is up next, and that's uh, Loudon. Loudon Nushin is Professor of Music at City University London. Her research interests include creative processes in Iranian music, music and youth culture in Iran, music and gender, urban music and sound studies, and music in Iranian cinema. She's co-editor of the Cambridge University Press series, Elements in Music and the City. She's vice president of the RMA and chair of the RMA EDI working group and co-chair of the Equalities, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Music Studies or EDIMS network. So Loudon, over to you. Many thanks, Mary. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm talking on this panel in my role as, uh, as Mary just said, I'm chair of the RMA, the Royal Musical Association's EDI Working Group, um, which has been up and running for about 15 months now. Um, and I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the EDI work that has been happening within the RMA um, as one example of how a professional music association uh, is dealing with these kinds of issues. Um, and I just wanted to start by explaining that the EDIMS network, in fact, started life as a collaboration between the RMA and Music HE, or NAMHE as it was then, um, following discussions about three years ago, really in response to growing concerns over issues of inequity and exclusion in the Music HE sector and really a felt need for a space uh, to discuss these issues and to share experiences and resources and so on. Um, but it, it soon became apparent that any such network really needed to go beyond just two organisations and become more of an umbrella group for the sector. And uh, hence EDIMS was born in the spring of 2020 with a steering group that includes representatives from each of the main UK music studies organisations. Um, and in fact, those of us speaking uh, are the representatives. So uh, uh, Mary represents Sempre on the EDIMS uh, steering group. I represent the RMA. Alexandra uh, represents uh, Buffy and so on. Um, so after EDIMS kind of broke away um, and became an independent network, uh, the RMA still felt that it needed a group um, to discuss and advise council and committees on EDI, EDI issues within the organisation. Um, and that's when the working group was set up. So that was in the autumn of 2020. Council agreed um, to set up an internal EDI group with a remit to raise awareness within the organisation and to recommend actions to council in relation to EDI issues and more broadly to embed EDI thinking and practices into all RMA work. I mean, that's the aspiration. Um, and at the first meeting of that working group, we decided on the title of working group rather than committee, that the RMA tends to have quite a lot of committees, but we decided that um, in line with our aspiration really for this to be a short term intervention and that what, what we're really aiming to bring about a situation where the group is no longer necessary. Um, so the working group currently has 10 members, mainly um, elected and co-opted members of RMA Council, 
um, and the working group meets three times a year and it reports directly to council. So what I want to do uh, today very briefly is to give some idea of the kinds of discussions and interventions so far. Um, perhaps less on the discussions, which as you might imagine have been quite complex and wide ranging, but more on the on the practical actions that we've taken to date. I think it's probably fair to say that the RMA has in the past been primarily historical musicology focused, um, but this has definitely been changing in recent decades and there's been a real desire and endeavour in the past five years or so to broaden out the organisation and to um, put into the centre areas of music study and practice that have tended to be somewhat peripheral. And so we can see this, for instance, in the formation of study groups in areas such as practice research, the popular music study group that Alexander leads, um, and there's another study group on technology and performance, for example. So in terms of the working group, one of our main concerns um, when we first started working was uh, trying to diversify the RMA membership. I think that's key, both in terms of personal demographics, if I can put it that way, but also in the er areas of musical study and practice um, and acknowledging the many kinds of underrepresentation in the organisation. Um, and we recognise that in order to foster a more diverse membership, we need to diversify the leadership and the decision making uh, bodies of the of the organisation. Um, so that in the case of the RMA, that means the council and the various committees. I think there are six or seven committees. Um, and this is a bit of a chicken and egg situation, uh, whether you, you know, diversifying membership and diverse, diversifying leadership. One sort of depends on the other. Um, so one thing that the working group has done in relation to council membership has been to propose and lobby for a co-option mechanism, which we didn't previously have, that is now in place as well as actively encouraging and seeking out nominations and self-nominations from individuals who would bring different kinds of diversity to council. Um, so just to be clear, this includes both more visible markers of difference, such as skin colour or gender, but also less obvious diversities, both personal and scholarly, um, including, for instance, the kind of institutions where council members are based. Um, and indeed beyond academia as well. So until very recently, council was pretty much dominated by red brick, mainly Russell Group institutions um, and without members uh, beyond academia. And that, that has changed, it's starting to change gradually. Um, and the same principles have been applied to our various prizes and grants where we have specifically approached and encouraged individuals to, to apply or be nominated. Um, so as, as I've said, we're essentially seeking to embed EDI thinking into everything that the RMA does. Um, so some sm some examples of small interventions include um, the fact, that, I mean, this is a tiny detail, but I think it's significant. So for example, EDI is now the first main agenda item on council meetings, rather than being tagged on at the end. That's probably more symbolic than anything else, but I do think it's important. Um, there is somebody on every RMA committee, um, so yes, there are a total of about six or seven committees. Um, so there's someone on every, RM, on, on every committee who has a responsibility to consider EDI issues in the matters of that committee. Uh, the conference handbook now includes guidance to conference organisers on holding EDI panels um, or EDI themed um, events at the main RMA conferences. Uh, in the spring of 2021, we conducted a survey of RMA members on EDI issues in order to inform discussions on council um, and in our working group and to gather views and ideas. Um, this also included questions relating to the name of the organisation and its logo, uh, which are not unproblematic. Um, and these discussions are ongoing and have elicited a wide range of responses, as I'm sure you can imagine. Among future activities, we have planned a consciousness raising slash reflective session around diversity and privilege awareness for council members and RMA officers. The RMA officers are people who are employed to do work for the RMA. Um, and we're working on further EDIing, I suppose is the word we would use, EDIing the website, both in terms of images and text. And images are particularly tricky. Um, Pictures really only reveal visible diversities, obviously, um, and there is a danger of fetishizing visible areas of underrepresentation, I think. Um, 
The RMA has, of course, tended in the past to reflect the demographics of historical musicology, naturally. Um, and whilst we are broadening out, it hasn't been easy to visually capture the most recent changes over the past two years due to the lack of in-person events. Um, so that is something we, we are working on and we need to do more on. Um, so just to wrap up then, so the RMA EGI Working Group has already done a fair amount, I would say, in its first 15 months, um, but we are very aware that there is still much to do. The RMA is a large and complex organisation with a strong sense of the weight of its own history and with members representing a wide diversity of views, um, not always sympathetic to the kinds of things that we're trying to do. Um, so that, that is one challenge in itself. Um, another challenge, I would say, is to recognise, um, to be realistic and to recognise what we have the power to change, uh, what we are only able to influence, directly or indirectly, and the things that we probably have no or little influence over. I think it's important to, to think about those things and to um, yeah, recognise the things that we actually have the power to do something about. So I will stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Loudon. And um, and it falls to me to be, to be the fourth person. Um, I'm Mary Stakelin, as I've already said. I'm area leader in um, music education at the Royal College of Music. Um, and I uh, research-wise, I have probably three strands. First one is in exploring children's musical worlds, musicality and so on. Uh, second one is historical perspectives on musical knowledge and curriculum development, uh, particularly in interested in how music became um, institutionalized in the education system in Ireland's long 19th century and, and beyond. And the third strand is uh, ethnographies of practice, specifically the relationship between formative experiences and practice. Um, where music education in the formal institutional setting can act as a powerful way of introducing a sense of place and tradition to people. And I'm trying to um, apply that now to inclusive music practices and to characterizing pedagogical knowledge beyond an implementation discourse rooted in Western art practices. Um, I am editor in chief of Music Education Research, published by Taylor and Francis, conference director of the Biennial International Conference in Research in Music Education, or RIME. And I'm also um, a member of SEMPRE and one of the five trustees on SEMPRE, the Society for Education and Music Psychology Research. And I represent them, as um, Loudon has mentioned, I represent them on the steering group of. EDIMS and it's in and I'm leading on this working group pathways to music and it's in this capacity that I'm going to give my um, my um, summary of where SEMPRE fits I guess in the in the EDIMS um, network and uh, SEMPRE as an organization is um, celebrating its 50th anniversary uh, this year 2022 and planning um, an anniversary um, conference in the autumn, more details of which um, which will emerge later on. But um, it's 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 one of the um, it's one of the ways in which it um, contributes to research and scholarship in the in the sector. Um, it has two conferences a year, um, one in the Easter and one in the um, one in the uh, sorry spring and one in the autumn. And um, it, one of the practical ways that I have found of of getting. Um, SEMPRI as a, as a getting I suppose visibility for ED, EDI is by um, uh, having having space on the conference program where we have um, discussion panels, um, and that's 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 proving to be um, really interesting just in terms of, of raising our raising awareness among the people who go obviously go to the conference, but also for the members of the um, the subgroup the working group. Pathways to music because they are taken from the music industry, from education. You know, they're, they're practitioners and researchers. I was really struck by um, Faye's idea of trying to be authentic with with all the different sort of co participants. Uh, we're really finding that in the in the working group that you know finding a voice for everybody um, involved in in um, in, e in EDI. So, so the so the um, the Sempre conference um, forum, if you like. Is a, is a really um, is one good way, I suppose, of breaking down the barriers and having these conversations that are inclusive in themselves. Um, so, so we've done a, a few of those, and we're planning to do um, 
hopefully get uh, another slot in um, what is probably a high vis event which will be the the uh, 50th anniversary conference in the in the autumn uh, so so as an organization um sempre considers itself to be unique in that it it's the only one that um, combines music education and psychology of music um, and it has, um, which makes it interesting, certainly from, from my perspective, but also it, it um, there, there are lots of, of tensions and synergies to explore. Um, it's very conscious of the fact that a lot of psychology tends to be um, perhaps um, rooted in, in um, well, obviously in, in perhaps um, experimental and, and uh, cognitive and developmental psychology, which, um, which you know, has, has um, but there's too, just, there isn't enough time to to um, to go into too much detail. But um, suffice to say that it has a pro probably um, if you, it can open itself up to scrutiny in terms of how inclusive it actually is and what the sort of questions it asks and what it considers the research problem to be and so on. So um, very interesting discussions um, are are being had there. One of the um, one of the um, I suppose the flagship. Uh, contributions it, it has is is the um, uh, research journals. It has three. It has psychology of music, and it has uh, research studies in music education, and it has the more recent um, addition to that, which is uh, music and science, which is an online journal. So it so it has a quite a, wi a wide reach, and, and as that um, all of the um, members and certainly the trustees are very aware of. Um, of our um, mission, I suppose, to 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 evolve, uh, to be more inclusive. Uh, um, so so that's that's work in progress. But but um, one of the things that we have done is, and it's it's um, resonated with with what you said, Loudon, about the RMA, is that we now have um, EDI as a standing item on the agenda. I haven't quite got having it bumped up to the top yet that's my next plan but I think it's it's at least it's there and um and and I, I'm trying to um because obviously I, I report I report on the working group and the, the subgroup the work of Edens um the subgroup um and and it's good just to 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 have it have it in on the radar um and um my my next plan is to have a um a memorandum or a mission statement or a state you know a statement of intent on the website we haven't got that yet but that is certainly my my next plan so so that so that we have um i suppose we've set ourselves some tangible aims and objectives um but there's certainly goodwill in this in sempre and, and an awareness that that um while it started in you know 50 years ago the, the terrain was very different um, but but I think we we um, we are we are conscious that we do need to um, constantly um, hold ourselves to account and, and make sure that we are representative of music education and psychology music more broadly. Um, we have um, uh, we have um, funding opportunities for for research um, and. Um, they're, they're on the website uh, sempre.org.uk and, and that's something that we're actively looking at again just to see exactly how, how inclusive are they and perhaps we could maybe um, make, make them um, broader in their scope um, but we have um, in preparation for the, for the 2022 event the, the um, 50th anniversary we have um, launched and instigated and offered and indeed awarded some um, funding to um, research studies that um, are aimed at what we would call EDI issues. So, so that I think is, is um, augurs well for the future. Um, in terms of the, the subgroup, um, EDIMS related subgroup um, on pathways to music, that is, um, it's uh, going very well, but again, you know, it's on, it's on a, it's, um, slow it's sorry it's early days but um but we're all very committed to it and i haven't got time to go into it because I'm, I'm conscious i'm chairing the discussion for, for which we have 10 minutes so i'm going to stop there and um consider um questions that you might have um for any of our speakers indeed so i'll stop and just look at hands up for comments 
if there are any. Because I could quite happily talk until six o'clock without any problem, but I'm being very restrained. <laughs> I guess it's maybe, oh yeah, Faye, okay, yes, Faye, I was going to suggest, open it up to the speakers first, yeah. Hello, yeah, no, it's a horrible moment, isn't it? Um, so fascinating, I'm loving all the different perspectives today. Um, but one thing that really struck me was from Alexander talking about, like, it's great that we've got all these different perspectives, but that real fundamental thing of changing how we think is just so huge, isn't it? And, and just seems absolutely relevant. So doing all the bits of pockets of work are completely important and completely necessary, but it kind of doesn't touch that that fundamentalness um, and I, I yeah that really hit me so I was wondering Alexander and I can see that 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 you're not seeing that that's happening in a joined up way in BFE at the moment but do you know of any examples of organizations or systems or countries or anywhere that is managing to look at it on that kind of level that we might be able to learn from? Um, what a likable question Faye um, I feel like a a killjoy, um, but I have been looking. Um, I see fragments of ideas, but um, succinctly, part of what is giving me a headache is that if there is a trend, as I'm discerning it, I speak for myself, it is that something like a really extraordinary bit of insight seems to be joined to something really unhelpful. And so there is a sort of a moving forward, and then there is an undermining, and the proximity of this. Um, so one quick example is a bit of work that's taken place on um, jazz manouche communities. Um, I'm reviewing a book for Chicago, Univers for Chicago University Press. Um, great discussion of the niceties of ethnicity and the rest of it, and then just really collapsed notions of whiteness that really undermine what the author, um, what the researcher has been doing. So um, yeah, I think we're gonna have to make some. Yeah, thanks. Can, can I just have, have a quick one, just, just to, to um, I suppose, um, put in a plug for the power of education. I was, um, you know, I was just reflecting on, on David's um, presentation and um, it reminded me of, you know, way back when I was an undergraduate in the 80s in University College Cork, where we were exposed to Irish traditional musicians um, coming in. They got their bread and butter from the courses that that were that they did at the college for us, um, along with the tabla and, you know, um, all, all sorts of um, what you might call tasters. Um, and, and we were exposed to those that they weren't they weren't accredited. They were they were experiential. Um, and looking back at it now, you know, whatever, for nearly 40 years later, I actually considered that that at the time you know, it, it took a while to percolate. What, what what that gave me and I'm sure others of my generation was at least an awareness of the parity of of others of sounds other than something that I was brought up with. So so my point really is that, you know, change is slow. And I think that that um, that these things just take a while, and and so I, I don't think I could be naive, Douglas, but I are at least Alexander Big Burden. I don't think that um, that we can, you know, it it is a, it is a slow process, and uh, I think at least we're starting. So I don't know whether that's helpful or not, but um, I I just think that that edu educators don't hear enough about the impact they make on people. Just small steps. Um, don't know whether that helps or not. That that's just what I was thinking when when I was hearing these things. Do you want to come back at me with anything, Alexander? I mean, it's it's an, a conversation that we need more time for. But yes, yeah. I far be it to decry that um, that some things have moved forward. Um, so it's how and obviously David was very careful to say let's not be too self congratulatory about certain things. But at yeah. the same time, we do need to acknowledge that when some things have happened, they've happened. Um, what do we do when the paradoxes include that the mechanisms that do afford progress um, also contribute to negating the types of understanding? So now, for example, even something epistemic 
injustice, epistemic justice, um, when Jose Medina argues that we need a theory of injustice rather than a theory of justice, because justice is not the norm, that's fantastic. But then he offers an epistemology of, resistant, of resistance or a framework for that, that is still more sociological than it is epistemological. So we're still not getting to that tougher question of actually how gnosis and episteme, how knowledge, how thought, how understanding actually changes. So th this is what concerns me. We, yes, but. Yeah, yeah, okay, David, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, 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 I'm obviously, Alexander, I'm not privy to the details of what you've been saying, but I, I, I sense your frustration and I understand it. Um, and I can imagine what some of those things might be, given the whole fraud nature around so many aspects of what we're now calling EDI. Um, I mean, I suppose all I could, my, my own feelings there are perhaps not, well, maybe there's some, your pessimism might actually have some dialectical value in it. Um, there's a wonderful line in Adorno who says something about um, grey could not fill us with despair were it not for flashes of colour that are not yet absent from the whole or something typically Adorno like that. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to say in a way that, that, as you said, there are these glimpses of things, right? And I, I think, um, I mean, we all have our own hopes uh, for all of this, um, but um, it's not, we know it's not going to happen overnight. It's a kind of platitude to say that, but and the, but also the process is not going to be a smooth linear one historically. We know that it's been a messy process. It's been fraught with debate um, and worse. Um, and no doubt it will continue to be so. Um, so, um, and, and this is going to be a generational thing. So I, I think it's a question of time scales. It's like, and I, actually I found some of the things that Loudon said quite heartening, just some little material things like, okay, we'll move EDI to the top of the agenda rather than at the bottom. Now, little things like that can be done and they're small achievements, but they're achievements and, and they're perhaps indicative of some kind of change of kind con or changing consciousness. Um, the really structural things I mean, there's been the whole question about, you know, the pipeline. I mean, you know, we're too old now. I'm too old. You know, we won't see it in our generation. We, it's too late, you know, to start some things. Um, you know, university is too late for, to, for some of these things. We need to, we have to get in there early. You know, it, first schools uh, and whoever we is in this context. But that's where the work is done. But that's not to get anybody off the hook further up the pipeline. Everybody has to do what they can. But... Um, so what am I saying here? I, I guess it's just going to be a long process. It has to be, we have to look at different timescales. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's a kind of multi-fronted thing. And there will be setbacks and there will be complexes. And I would say above all, my own hope is for some kind of also what I've <laughs> called an um, epistemic peace. That actually that this needs, the whole thing needs a lot of compassion actually for, for people that we think are perhaps failing at this as well. If we don't have that compassion, then um, nothing will move forward, actually. And that's not just some kind of liberal, um, you know, tolerance idea. I'm not, I'm not about, I'm not really into tolerance, but, but I think it is important that we have to be um, in some way, uh, be patient and try and continue in dialogue. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, we've got two hands up. We've got Loudon and then Cherie. So Loudon. We have time for those, I think, and then we'll have to close. Sorry, I mean, obviously, this is a <laughs> this is a massive discussion. I was just going to make the point that that's that's precisely why the kinds of modules that David runs and other ones that are happening cross country are so important because those are the students who are then going to go into the schools teaching the children, and so there's a there's a kind of cyclic cyclical thing happening here as well in terms of um, widening the curriculum, um, yeah, within education. That, that's that's exactly that was the point I was trying to make. Thanks for that. Um, and Sheree, yeah, and then we'll have to close up. That'll be the last one. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, um, for all your thoughts. And I was just picking up on, on Loudon's point on intergenerational approaches um, and uh, speaking as a um, end of early moving towards mid career person. Um, I'm feeling that I'm learning a lot from students and I have a lot of faith and hope in them. 
But at the same time, I'm also terrified um, that a lot of debates about EDI are going to be um, swept under the carpet when other kinds of concerns, such as climate change, um, are going to be at the forefront of these discussions. And I'm, there's part of me that thinks there is space for these sorts of intersectional um, understandings. Um, but I also am working in an environment now where um, I'm seeing young people um, who are very ofe with they them pronouns um, and take for granted EDI issues, but don't necessarily practice them or they write wonderful, brilliant essays, but don't necessarily do as much self-reflection with regards to personal practice. And I think this leads me to my second point about how can we build better scripts um, and the earlier point about safe spaces and brave spaces and how, how we can work um, um, towards undoing bad faith and creating more good faith and positivity. It's been difficult because I've been trying to rethink the way I do EDI and call in as opposed to call out people. But even so, calling in has been a, a difficult thing. I've tried to do this in private and yet get told off by the persons um, that I have called in um, for being ungenerous and uncompassionate. Um, and I think there is a misunderstanding at stake um, here in terms of the structuration of how we have difficult conversations. So just maybe something to think about. How, how do we build more good faith and get out of bad faith scripts? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. We, we will have to draw this to a close now, but um, I want to thank um, everybody, particularly um, Faye and David for the, those presentations and um, the, 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 or the four presenters. So I was just trying to look before we before we close loud and at the next of these um, open events, but I can't find it in my diary, but there is one coming, isn't there, in later in the spring. Sorry to put you on the spot, but um, that's it's fine. Yeah, no, I have them all in my head. <laughs> 23rd of March <laughs> is the next one. Um, there are speakers from uh, Catherine Schofield from King's College and some other speakers. It'll be coming around the list. So 23rd of March. Um, Thank okay. you all for coming here. Yeah. And thank you, Mary, for chairing. Thank you, pleasure. Okay, all the best, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again to all the speakers. Yeah, fantastic.